All right, Mitch. The hummingbirds are here. They are here. All right. I've heard a lot of people talk about uh, the hummingbirds. I can't wait to get some in my house. So here's the question, though, that we everybody likes to ask. What about hummingbird feeders? Mm -hmm. You know, how do you locate them? Where do you go to purchase them and things like that? So can you enlighten us? Sure thing. Okay. So there's a variety of um, hummingbird feeders out there on the market. Okay. Um, this is the typical one that we sell at Strawberry Plains. Another place you could get here in Memphis is um, Wild Birds Unlimited. Mm -hmm. But um, you can even go to general places like Walmart, I think, will sell them. It really just depends on what you're looking for. Um, we recommend these because they're sturdy, they're glass, um, they hold up well over the seasons. But um, your next question was about the location? Yeah, but where do you locate the feeders themselves? So we just say, where do you like to hang out? Where okay. do you like to eat dinner? Uh, maybe have a beer <laughs> after work? Uh, typically, where's your relaxation spot? Because hummingbirds are highly mobile. They're going to move to the spots where they uh, sense the nectar. and so. I recommend, you know, maybe a back porch or outside your kitchen window where you might do dishes or, um, you know, prep your dinner. Okay. Just as long as there's enough space, you know, a good foot to two feet between that and the window or building itself. Okay. Makes sense. Now, what about cleaning it? Well, cleaning it, you know, it's, um, it's a lot easier than it seems. You okay. know, it's basically <laughs> the nectar is just a sugar water solution. You know, we mix one part sugar to four parts water. Um, real quick, I'll just say we use hot water. Um, hot don't need water. to be boiling, but... The sugar does need to be dissolved in the water, and so we typically take a large gallon jug and um, fill it with sugar part, then add hot water, shake it up. And once that water or the uh, sugar is dissolved, just tap it off with cold water, and you're ready to go. You can store that in the fridge and use it for the next couple of days. So mm. when it gets time to clean your feeder or you see that it's empty, we recommend washing it out each time that you do bring it in. Basically, you just unscrew. You can hold this under the faucet itself with some hot water, rinse it out, should be good to go. But if you do get some black mold or anything like that, we recommend not using soap, using just a light bleach solution, like a one to 10, and that should clear it out. Um, as for actual scrubbing, we do <laughs> sell these types of devices that can scrub the inside of the glass itself. Um, fits down. I won't stick it all the way in because it's okay. not wet, but uh, you can scrub it out. And then again, with the actual feeding holes themselves, we also have these type of scrubbers that go inside the hole and get any type of particulates or such that might have gotten in there and clogged it. Wow, how about that? Now, when do we need to take our feeders down? Well, that's the big question. Okay. Uh, we recommend you do not take them down. Do um, not? Actually, that's, yeah, that's oh. correct. So a lot of people have been concerned, oh, if I leave my feeders up, the hummingbirds won't know to go south and they'll stay oh. here throughout the winter. Actually, uh, hummingbirds have a much more innate um, sense of time and when to go than we actually give them credit for. And a lot of the work that's been done by uh, some individuals with the former uh, hummingbird study group on the coast in Alabama were the first to recognize this, that there's a lot of species of not the ruby throat, which is what we get mostly yeah. west of the Mississippi, but western species will actually sometimes get pushed over in storms and will actually overwinter here. And so wow. we have several wow. species that have been noted throughout the past decade that have overwintered throughout the whole season here in Mississippi. So we say, unless there's a reason for you to take it down, um, you know, someone's complaining about it, we say leave at least one up and just kind of check it throughout the season. Wow, so just leave it there. Mm -hmm. Okay. So no concerns about the rough winter weather or anything like that? Well, you know, they're, if they're here, uh, we want to give them something to eat. Okay. So, sure. you know, definitely check on it. Um, at times, we've had uh, overwintering birds that it has gotten well below freezing. Right. And we've even set up kind of areas where we'll put some uh, heat lamps on it cool. to ensure that that, you know, uh, mixture doesn't freeze. Cool. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's talk about the native plant sale. Yes, sir. So what do we need to know about that? So our native plant sale is May 15th and 16th. Um, it is one of the biggest outreach opportunities we have to talk about the importance of native plants mm -hmm. to both support and attract wildlife to your home and garden. Um, during that plant sale, we'll actually be doing a program uh, I'll be facilitating at 1 p.m. each day. It's going to be free to the public, and it's part of uh, the National Audubon Society's new Hummingbirds at Home program. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, you can go to it at hummingbirdsathome.com. It's a web-based smartphone app as well as website app that encourages individuals of all ages and backgrounds uh, without any science or bird background. You can significantly contribute as a citizen to the scientific work that's being done to understand how hummingbirds are being affected by climate change. If bloom periods are happening at earlier times than we anticipated in the past, how are the birds reacting? And so it gives you an opportunity to input not only the, the amount of birds you're seeing, but what are they feeding on? And that's going to influence a lot of our understanding about these birds' life cycles in the future. How about that? Yeah. 
Mr. D likes that. <laughs> mm -hmm. Pretty good. Let me ask you about this though, Mitch. So how did you become interested in hummingbirds? Well, it's kind of par for the course working at Strawberry Plains. Okay. We're kind of known as the hummingbird uh, center of you know the southeast. But um, I have to say, it really was being so intimately connected to them on a daily basis, uh, working there over the past year. Uh, being able to sit at lunch and look out and count anywhere from a dozen to two dozen hummingbirds, wow. you know, somewhat violently going at each other, fighting for this food <laughs> for such a small, beautiful little specimen. It's just uh, fascinating how such a small creature can have um, such a, a, a massive migration pattern mm -hmm. and be so um, specifically focused on returning every year to the same areas yeah. to breed. Um, just absolutely remarkable creatures. Yeah, that's what I think is so remarkable about it as well. Mr. Day? Do you ever have any problems <laughs> with pests yeah. getting in your hummingbird feeder like raccoons? Raccoons, not specifically. Um, ants are the big issue. Another yeah. little thing that we suggest, it's you can actually make these if you wanted to get crafty, but uh, it's basically just a little cup that will be suspended from a string, the same one your hummingbird feeder is suspended from, and you just fill it with water. It'll keep Take out ants, ants, but it'll also serve as a water source for hummingbirds. You know, well, hummingbirds don't depend just on nectar, they eat insects. Mm -hmm. uh, oftentimes people will ask, well, where did my hummingbirds go? They were here and they disappeared. Well, during this time of year, a lot of those first hummingbirds you're seeing are scouts, and they may actually be leaving the area and heading further north okay. to their uh, original breeding grounds. But as you move further into the season and into the summer, the females, when their um, eggs hatch, will actually be feeding their insects solely, or excuse me, feeding their nestlings solely insects, most of which okay are butterfly and moth larvae, caterpillars. Wow. Okay. So um, oftentimes if you just see a lot of activity and then the next day it diminishes, that's often the, the possibility is that the birds have either moved on to their grounds or they're actually feeding insects. Yeah. Hornworm control. Hornworms, I was thinking of the there same thing. There you go. Yeah. There you are. When you say uh, caterpillars, I was thinking about that. If you do have pests on some of your fruits and vegetables, you know, it may not be a bad idea to have some hummingbird feeders nearby. It's not a bad yeah. idea, especially yeah. near your vegetable garden. Yeah. Right. Hmm. It's not too bad. So this goes on top. I want to explain that one more time. So the string hangs down from okay. here to the feeder, and then okay. above okay. this you'll have another string that hangs to either the shepherd's okay. hook or to the overhang from your roof. And okay. um, they, they drown on their way to the honey. They do. The they do. And maybe water. there's something else that'll eat those ants. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> the only other thing we've had issues with is sometimes bees will uh, congregate, and the birds will have to compete with them. Uh, we've heard that if you can actually put a pan below the feeders if it's an area where you're not going to be walking around much. With just that same solution, the bees would rather much, or spend their time much more in that pan where they have more of a resource than having to fight the hummingbirds, so. Makes sense, <laughs> makes sense. Mitch, we appreciate that information. Absolutely. All right.